We prepare this morning for worship by lighting the Christ candle, remembering Christ is here among us and that the God of love gathers us here. As we quiet ourselves, we ask for the light of Christ to enlighten us and to show us the way. Good morning. This past week, summer decided to flex and show us not only how hot it can be, but how humid it can be. Depending on the temperature, spending time outside is carefully calculated. But in reality, it feels so good to know that we as a family can go to places safely. The last two years have left me personally, um, uh, in particular, fearing, feeling very weary of our neighbors. With children who, until very recently, who could not be vaccinated, it made a lot of decisions for our family, well, just complicated. But a respite for our family, this is pretty awesome to have them up here. Um, um, a respite for our family is the pool during these hot summer months. But located um, only steps from our back door. Are you, if, I, if I move around, do you think they'll just follow me? Like, I don't know. <laughs> But located steps from our back door, our kids enjoy a pool complete with a slide and a swing set nearby. And this space has become an oasis on a hot summer evening. But this pool isn't located at our house. In fact, it belongs to our neighbors. These are neighbors who have shown up not only for us, but for the other neighbors in our little country neighborhood throughout the 15 years we've lived in Mount Township. Without being asked, they have been known to shovel walks, mow yards, and mowing yards in our neighborhood is about like an acre, <laughs> and drop off extra produce, no questions asked. Mike and Terry's love for their neighbors is one I imagine Jesus talking about in the verse we will hear today during, um, during today's service. So as we begin our service this morning, let us be hospitable to our neighbors and here in this congregation. So let's stand up and let's greet our neighbors to the right, to the left. And you know what, while we're at it, let's greet our neighbors in front of us and behind us. You never know when you might hear about someone's loose tooth that just appeared this morning. So let's stand and greet each other.
Well, uh, good morning to us all. Hello, Jake and Gabby. Hello, Lincoln and Lawrence. How are you both? Good. Um, was it hot at your house this week? Yeah, it was pretty hot at our house, too. We're a little farther from the equator, though, so it was probably a little cooler. You went in the swimming pool, too? Oh, man, what a good feeling. Do you, th do you think that they had, like, actual swimming pools about 2,000 years ago when it was this hot? Where'd they go swimming? What'd they do to get wet? Sprinklers? Oh, they probably jumped in, like, a lake or a river or some kind of body of water like that, right? Well, I want to tell you a story today, and we're going to, it's going to, it's, it's, a, it's a story you'll probably hear a lot of times in your life. Here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to scoot down here in just a second. Okay, can you just have a seat? Thank you. Uh, it's a story that you'll hear a lot of times in your life. It's about being a good neighbor, um, and it's a pretty important story without dribbling the basketball, right? That's being a traveler. Um, so there's this traveler traveling between towns. And as the traveler is traveling, all of a sudden, from out of nowhere, there comes a robber. What's that robber going to do? Oh, no. Oh, no. Man down. Oh, no. Oh, no. And he took my iPad. Oh, gosh. This isn't good. Okay. So, traveler is down. Oh, Jill, tell my parents I may not make it back. Okay, thanks. Okay, so I need, can you guys help me? Can you help me? I'm down for the count. Lincoln and Lawrence, I'm going to need your help too. We got to get some help. We got to go find some. Let's go see, do you think we could find a priest? Is there someone in this church who we think is kind of like a holy person? Someone who might teach us some things from the pulpit? Oh, there's a priest. Oh, let's go find the priest. Ugh. All right, let's get up here. Oh, oh, let's see what this priest has to say. Priest, I am hurt. I, I, I saw the guy do it, a red-headed flash of lightning. Uh, I am wondering, is there any chance, any chance you'd be able to help us? And who are you? Uh, I'm, a, I'm a traveler, a guy who travels. You're a priest. I think that's probably a job you'd have. I'm sorry. I don't do that kind of thing. I'm, I'm kind of busy right now. Sorry. Does he look busy right now? No. But he's not going to help us, so let's go find a different neighbor. All right. All right. Let's go see if we can find another neighbor. You know who else might help us? A Levite. I think a Levite would probably help us, don't you? Okay. Let's go see if we find a Levite anywhere back here. Oh, man. I think I may have broken some ribs. Oh. Oh, I see a Levite, guys. I see a Levite. Oh, man. Oh, there, there's the Levite. Oh, thank goodness. Oh, thank goodness. Okay, Levite, we've seen the priest. The priest didn't have time for us. Is there any chance you can help us, Levite? Well, I'd like to, but I've been really busy with church work lately, so sorry. Sorry, you're not the kind of person I would usually help anyway. I'm, I'm busy with more important things. Sorry. Well, that didn't go like we hoped it would, did it? We'd hope to get some help from the priest, too busy. We'd hope to get some help from the Levite, also too busy. I guess being the church board moderator is like a full-time job or something. Um, okay, well, let's keep looking, and maybe we'll find someone who can help us. I don't know. I got to get some medical attention here. Let's, I'm gonna, let's go back here. Let's kind of keep looking and see if we can find anyone who could possibly get us some medical attention. Oh, my goodness. Oh, holy cow, man. I think I sprained both of my ankles on that hit. Lincoln and Lawrence, you guys coming? We're going to need all the help we can get here. I, let's go back towards the front and see if there's anyone this way. Oh, goodness. Oh, my goodness. Anyone who can help us, anyone at all who could help us. The Paw Patrol? Well, the... I didn't even think to yelp for help. I should have yelped for help. Okay, what about this nice man in the black shirt here? Do you think he could help us? He's a Samaritan, so I doubt he'll say yes, because they're not like us. Um, 
But shall we check with the Samaritan and see if he'll help us? Okay, Samaritan, will you help us? I think I've broken all my bones. I'd like to help you by getting some insurance for you, if, if that would be helpful. But we're talking about getting hurt by all of these robbers, and here you are all bundled up, sad. Are your ki kids sad for you, too? They are very sad. In fact, they've been traipsing around with me this whole time. Uh, if there are any, any things you could do for them to help them, I, I'll probably end up being okay, but is there anything you could do to help support them? That would be something you could do to help us all, maybe? Well, let me tell you, I am a humble some, some Samaritan, a man from Samaria, and I come from a small village, and I will do anything I can to help you. And I also have something. Before I came on my journey, I stopped and picked from my orchard in my little village in Samaria some fruit. Oh, my goodness. I just wonder whether these young people oh, would, like have some would you like some fruit? Yes. And it's even pre packaged. Pre oh, man, this is truly a good Samaritan. I'm, I might even say great Samaritan, but for the purpose of the story, we'll say good. Oh, should I give some of these to my caretakers? Okay. Oh, here. This person needs a fruit. Oh, what do we tell the Samaritan? Thank you, Samaritan. You have been such a good neighbor to us. Okay. All right. All right. Let's go finish up our story. Okay. So... We had several things happen there. One, I got blindsided by Brad. Two, did we get help from everybody we asked for help from? Who didn't help us, Lincoln? The priest didn't help us, and we think often that that should be the case. Who else didn't help us? The Levite also didn't help us. Uh, Levite would be a person who often would help. Who did help us, though? The good Samaritan helped us. And that's what a good neighbor does. Without asking any questions, whether they're like you or not, whether they eat the same foods you do, whether they vote the same way you do, whether they uh, have a swimming pool or a garden, or whether they simply help drive you to a doctor's appointment sometime. That's what a good neighbor does. Takes care of us when we need help. And like the Paw Patrol would say, when you need help... Just yelp for help. Let's have a prayer. God, you call us to be neighbors, to be good Samaritans. Open our ears and our hearts to listen to you when someone needs a neighbor, whatever that looks like. In your name we pray. Amen. and the parable of the Good Samaritan as told in the book of Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. I am reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Do this and you will live. And Jesus said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this, and you shall live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, 
A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling that way, came near, and when he saw him, he had pity. He went to him, bandaged up his wounds, having poured on oil and wine. Then he put him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and whatever you pay more, I will repay you when I return. Which of these do you think was the neighbor to the man who fell among robbers? The one who helped him and showed mercy to him, came the answer. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Please join me in prayer. Gracious God, thank you for this time of worship and all those who are gathered here in this place and joining us online. We ask for your spirit to guide our thoughts and reflections so what comes to mind may represent your will for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I, I have to tell you that um, after, spending, after spending a week or so looking at this scripture text and preparing for today, I have this, this overwhelming need to apologize to, to Adam for not helping out. It's... Uh, and that is, that just, uh, that is, it's an interest, yeah, it's interesting. But thank you for that children's story. That is applicable because, uh, because back in 1970, uh, Princeton Seminary actually did an experiment. Uh, perhaps, you've, perhaps you've heard about it. They wanted to test a theory about how people act when they are in a hurry as a possible explanation or a reason for the way that the priest and the Levite and the Samaritan respond to the circumstances in this parable. Here was their premise. They wrote, they wrote could it be the cause of not stopping wasn't indifference or self-centeredness or contempt? And maybe instead it was time pressure. So to perform the experiment, they asked a bunch of students at their seminary to prepare and deliver a, a sermon on the Good Samaritan. The students knew that the sermon would be evaluated by their professor. However, unbeknownst to them, they were also part of this experiment. The students had adequate time to sit with and to sit with this parable and to prepare. 
And when the day came for them to deliver their sermon, they were, they were directed to, to wait in a building across campus from where they were going to do so. <clears throat> one by one, as the students got ready to, to leave the waiting area and present their sermon, they were given one of three notes. A third of the students were told that they were late and that they should hurry. A third were told that their professors were ready for them and they should go straight over. And then a third were told to head over, but they may have a, they have a, few, they may have a few minutes to, to wait when they got there. All the students, as they walked over, ran into a bystander who was in trouble and was needing assistance. Now, keep in mind, these were all seminary students, and they had all been spending time focusing on the story of the Good Samaritan. And here's what they found. Most of the students who believed they had enough time to stop did. 63%, two-thirds of them. Of those who were in a hurry but not necessarily late, 45% helped the person in need. Almost half. But only, only 10% of the students who were told that they were late stopped. The researchers concluded the perception of time pressure uh, or having limited time resulted in behavior different than what they had been taught or what they would have expected. The weight of time constraint caused the students to put their immediate concern of being on time before the well-being of someone in need. Furthermore, what they found was a phenomenon called, that they called narrowing of the cognitive map. Specifically, when we, when we speed up or feel rushed, we miss details. We are not present enough in the moment to notice what might be really important. Apparently, many of the students who were in a hurry didn't even comprehend that they had come across a person in need. Illustrating that when, when we are in a hurry, even well-meaning people miss details and maybe are not present enough in the moment to notice what might be really important. So, in our parable, was maybe the Levite and the priest simply incapable of seeing this, this person in need because they were in such a rush? Was that the reason that they didn't stop and help? Can we relate? Have there been times when you are so focused on something else that you overlook details or circumstances that are right in front of you? Are things so packed and rushed in our, in our lives that we may not even be capable of responding to Jesus' call to go and do likewise? And what do you think Jesus would say to all that? Today, we have the parable of the Good Samaritan, one of, those, one of those dear classic scripture texts that communicate Jesus's hope and expectation regarding our relationships with each other. The parable of the Good Samaritan and the Samaritan's kindness stands in stark contrast to Nathan's scripture and sermon from last week and King Ahab. King Ahab, who more closely resembles the thieves who left our man half dead on the side of the road than anyone else on the story, anyone else in our, in our story. If you remember, King Ahab was pining for another person's vineyard. He started moping around because he couldn't secure it for himself. He ends up getting some help from Jezebel 
and eventually gets the land's owner stoned to death, allowing Ahab to take over that piece of property. So yeah, kind of sounds a lot like the thieves in our parable. I bring this up for a couple of reasons. First, because the the primary role model in our story is the Good Samaritan. And the Good Samaritan, along with Jesus' expectations of how we are supposed to relate to each other, are just so opposite to King Ahab of last week that it's just striking. But second, also this whole conversation about being blinded to a need, to blind it to a need for whatever reason, and realizing in retrospect what that blindness did. I think it shines a light on our intentional and unintentional treatment of other people. I have to wonder, I wonder what a, I wonder what a good Samaritan type response would look like regarding the indigenous people or those who were colonized out of their homes or those who faced slavery or those who continue to face systematic racism or other similar situations where people have been unjustly hurt and left on the side of the road intentionally or unintentionally and then not acknowledged or helped as people walked by. I offer this as a point of connection with what Nathan shared last week, but also a real tangible set of examples for us to consider as we dive deeper into this parable. Interestingly, Jesus, in the telling of the parable of the Good Samaritan, doesn't spend a whole lot of time with the thieves and the robbers. In fact, there are no details about them. There's no details about them at all. And only a little bit more about the victim. We read that the man was beaten, robbed, and left half dead on the side of the road, somewhere between Jerusalem and Jericho. And that is it. Very matter of fact with no real need to illustrate that wrong that has been done to this man because it's obvious. Jesus, in telling this parable, moves quickly from the obvious injustice that's in this story and goes straight to the heart, straight to the focus of what he wants us to know, namely the response of the people who meet this person who has been left half dead. Jesus shares about about three people, but only two different responses. The priest and the Levite come upon this man who was beaten, one after the other. Both of them are Israelites and would have been people of God, possibly even highly regarded, particularly the priest. They are the ones who are expected to be the heroes in this story. Yet both of them encounter this crime scene and this person on the side of the road and they pass by on the other side. Next comes the Samaritan who may have had different faith understandings than the Levite and the priest. In fact, in fact, if we remember from a couple weeks ago, it was a Samaritan village that rejected Jesus when he was seeking hospitality. And yet in contrast to the Levite and the priest, the Samaritan stops. He helps. He even assumes responsibility for the well-being of this battered stranger that he had just met. Leaving Jesus to ask, so which of these three do you think was the neighbor to the injured man? The answer, the one who showed mercy, the one who illustrated compassion, the one who cared, 
the Samaritan. And then he leaves us with the instruction, go and do likewise. Now, I will say, Jesus isn't particularly harsh with the priest and the Levite for not stopping. He just makes it very clear that isn't what he hopes for and expects. In fact, in telling the parable, Jesus gives us about as much information about the Levite and the priest as he does the victim in the story. Not much at all. Jesus in this parable also doesn't provide any commentary on why they did or did not stop. He leaves it up to us to come up with possible reasons or to run experiments to help understand why those two didn't stop. And those reasons do matter. There are reasonable and valid and relatable reasons why they may not have stopped, like the Princeton Seminary study came up with, or safety reasons, or whatever. But putting those circumstances to the side, I think this parable leaves us with the example of a person who did notice, who did stop, who wasn't blinded by being rushed, who was able to see the need of, the need of others who took responsibility in the moment to meet the need of another person. Leaving Jesus to conclude, go and do likewise. Love your neighbor in the same form and fashion that the Samaritan showed mercy and love and care to a complete stranger in need. Which actually takes us back to the beginning of our scripture text for this morning. As Diane read in our scripture this morning, Jesus uses this parable to answer, to answer a question following an exchange between Jesus and a lawyer. The lawyer asks Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus answers the lawyer's question with a question, asking him, well, what do you think? And the lawyer answers well. And he talks about how we need to love God with our whole being, and we need to love our neighbor as ourselves. Jesus affirms him for his answer. But the lawyer asks a follow-up question, and a good one. He asks, and who is my neighbor? At which point Jesus launches into the parable we have just talked about. But that question of who is my neighbor still needs some special attention. According to Jesus, the Samaritan and the man who was beaten and robbed and left half dead on the side of the road became neighbors. There is no prior relationship between them as far as we know, and yet they became neighbors. There is no significance placed on what they believe or if they share the same religion or ideology or opinions. It didn't matter how they looked or the color of their skin or the clothes they wore or how much money they did or did not have. It didn't matter where they are coming from or where they're going to. They don't share a fence. They don't live on the same block or in the same village. Nothing is mentioned about, uh, about a reciprocal agreement to, uh, to, in any way, to reciprocate that goodwill or that care provided or to pay back in any way, shape, or form. And yet they became neighbors. So it seems to me, according to Jesus, the defining attribute of being a neighbor is seeing the other person, showing care, having compassion, extending mercy. 
In fact, the lack of reasons for these two to connect and become neighbors seems, seems appropriate and intentional. Because maybe there doesn't need to be a whole lot of reasons. That stuff isn't supposed to define whether we see a person as a neighbor or not. Our pool of neighbors is supposed to be big and broad and inclusive. It is not supposed to be limited because God's love is not limited. To close, I would like to borrow some wisdom from, uh, from Martin Luther King. On April 3rd, 1968, Martin Luther King gave a sermon referencing this parable of the Good Samaritan. This was the day before his assassination when he was speaking to a, a crowd of striking sanitation workers. Martin Luther King said, the first question that the priest asked, the first question that the Levite asked was, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? But the Good Samaritan came by and he reversed the question. He asked, if I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? I feel the biggest obstacle to fulfilling Jesus' instruction for us to go and do likewise may just be needing to train ourselves to just, to just see the other person, put ourselves in the other person's shoes, keeping our eyes open, being merciful, inclusive, caring, and compassionate. Avoiding the tendency to cling to reasons not to show love and mercy. That is, if they maybe aren't really good reasons in the first place. And then keeping our, keeping our neighbor tent big. Extend our gaze broadly. Having confidence that we have something good to give. Feeling committed as followers of Jesus to go and do likewise. One commentary I read stated that this may be one of the most popular parables in the Bible. So you have all heard this stuff before. So, may we simply be encouraged and empowered by this reminder. Amen. We will stand to sing together number 790. How can we be suffering?
God, we come to you this morning, praying we are the neighbors you call us to be, knowing we are broken and knowing we will fail. There are and will be times when our words and actions will, be appear, will appear to be more of the Levite or priest. Allow us to remove the scales from our eyes to see our neighbors the way you see them, a child of God. Lord, as we leave this building to go into our, to our respective neighborhoods, we ask for these words to take root in our heart and grow healthily for all to experience. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. In your name we pray, amen. benediction is from Colossians 1 verses 10 through 12. May you lead lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to God. As you bear fruit in every good work and as you grow in the knowledge of God, may you be made strong with all the strength that comes from God's glorious power. And may you be prepared to endure everything with patience, while, j while, while joyfully giving thanks to the Creator who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> 